In this clip, we will discuss regression assumptions with time series data. Here's our model. It looks very normal. The only difference is at first sight that we have these little subscripts T. They indicate that we are using time series data. You further need to consider what the uh, vector xt will be. So this is xt, the explanatory variable, is going to be a vector of data that are available at time t. Let's use an example. Let's say our dependent variable is inflation at time t and the explanatory variable may then be a vector. So xt is a vector where the first element could be a 1 to indicate that we have a constant and we could have unemployment at time t but perhaps also unemployment at time t minus 1 and t minus 2 so in previous quarters and we indeed may have values of inflation itself lagged at time t minus 1 and t minus 2 so this xt is going to be a vector of explanatory variables. So let's look at some real data here. We have two time series for the UK from 83 quarter 1 to 2013 quarter 3, unemployment and inflation, annual series. The question is now, what changes if we have to consider time series data? Now one of our Gauss-Markov assumptions for, was that the samples of YT and XT are IID, they are random samples. That was assumption A2. Now, meaning that one observation is independent from the next. Now this is clearly not the case as if you look at Y for let's say 1990 quarter 1 and X 1990 quarter 1 it should read that it and the next sample Y at 90 quarter 2 and X at 90 quarter 2 these are clearly related to each other so they're clearly not IRD random samples. So that assumption doesn't hold and it's basically unlikely to hold for most time series data. Now given that, what about the properties of our OLS estimators beta hat? Okay, and I'll give it an OLS subscript saying uh, OLS estimators. Firstly, unbiasedness, we needed that assumption A2. So we can't expect our parameter estimates to be unbiased. The same for uh, with efficiency, we also needed assumption A2. So these properties are unlikely to hold. Now, can we establish any nice properties for beta hat OLS when we are using time series data? Fortunately, the answer to that is yes. However, we will not be able to establish any nice properties. So we will not be able to establish any nice properties for small samples. Okay, unless we make assumptions basically that the data are IID again, that's what Woodridge does in his chapter 10. Then you can basically establish the same results as previously. But that's not re very realistic for time series data. However, even if we don't make that assumption, even if we allow for realistic time series assumptions, meaning that observations are dis dependent on each other, we can establish nice properties for large samples so asymptotically and that is what Wooldridge does in chapter 11. That's the difference between chapter 10 and 11 in Wooldridge. So that's the approach we're going to take. We're going to look at what assumptions do we need to establish nice properties for our less parameter estimates. So we need a new set of, of assumptions. Our basic model is just replicated here again. Now assumption 1 or time series assumption 1. This is now the crucial one. Assume that the model is as indicated above as this one and that the draws of the random variables yt and xt for all time periods t1 to capital T are stationary and weakly dependent. Right, so this is the assumption which we need. What does this all mean? Let's look at the definition for stationarity to be precise what we call covariant stationary. The assumption is that unconditional first two moments, that's the expected value of yt and xt and the variance of yt and the variance of xt as well as the covariance between yt and xt, that these guys, all these characteristics, are constant through time. 
right, that do not depend on time and also that the autocovariance that's the covariance between yt and itself but h period previously and the covariance between xt and itself but h periods previously only changes with that lag h but is otherwise not dependent on time. So this is all a little bit uh, abstract. So consider this time series here which I sketch. All right, let's call that yt. Just think about splitting it in two and you can for the first period you can estimate the expected value, the variance, the covariance between yt and yt minus 1 and covariance between yt and yt minus 2 and you can calculate all these characteristics as well for the second sub-period. So then the question is how do these two sets of characteristics compare? If yt is covariance stationary then all these characteristics are the same in both subsamples. If, however, yt is not covariance stationary, then they would be different. Okay, we'll have a little test later. Now, what about the definition of weakly dependency? A series of weakly is weakly dependent if the correlation between yt and yt minus h and the correlation between xt and xt minus h, the weakly dependence is a property of each individual series, if these correlations go to zero as h goes to infinity sufficiently fast. So consider this, we have inflation at 13 quarter 3 and we think about how is that correlated to previous values, say inflation at 13 quarter 2. Well it's correlated and most likely quite strongly, inflation is persistent. But how is it correlated to uh, one inflation 13 quarter 1, so 2? quarters prior. Well, it's still quite strong, but a little less, so that's a downward error. And yet one quarter previously still weaker. And if we go all the way back to 1980, quarter 4, how is 13 quarter 3 related with that? Not at all. Zero correlation, most likely. So the correlation goes autocorrelation from quite strong to zero. And what matters for weak dependence is that this transition from strong to zero correlation happens sufficiently fast enough. How to know whether it's sufficiently fast or not, that's not for this course to discuss. These definitions help to explain the meaning behind assumption TS1, ATS1. So let's continue with the second assumption required for time series data. We need to assume that there is no perfect correlation between the variables in the vector xt. We had to assume that previously as well, that's not new. The third assumption, which one is this? This is very important, this is the zero conditional mean assumption. That's basically unchanged. We call, as before, a variable xt that meets this assumption is con that this variable is contemporaneous exogenous. Now if we have assumptions 1 to 3, this is sufficient to establish that your less parameter estimate uh, beta hat is consistent. Now to prove this, what we need is a law of large numbers. Okay, But we need it for data which have properties as described by time series assumption 1 especially the dependency property, and such a law of large number exists, yay. Now, next assumption, time series assumption 4. This assumption is again very similar to the one we had in the Gauss-Markov assumptions. It's a homoscedasticity assumption, so we assume that the residual variance is constant or formally expressed. It's that the variance of ut conditional on xt is equal to sigma squared and that's the same for all time periods uh, from 1 to capital T, where capital T is what we label the sample size for time series data. Not n but capital T but it has the same meaning. The fifth assumption is new. So that's the assumption that there's no autocorrelation between s error terms at different times. We also call that no serial correlation assumption. Formally, 
we want the correlation between ut and ut minus h, so the residual error term at another period conditional on the excess at these periods to be zero. And that is for all lags h unequal to zero. Now if assumptions, time series assumptions 1 to time series assumption 5 are met, then we can establish that beta hat all s is asymptotically efficient. We can also establish that beta hat all s is asymptotically normally distributed. We can establish that t-tests are asymptotically normally distributed and f-tests are asymptotically f-distributed. So the, these last two points mean that inference works as long as we have a sufficient amount of data. You should note that for all this we need to be able to apply to establish this a law of large numbers and a central limit theorem and for data we need these for data which have the properties which we have allowed here in particular the dependence properties unfortunately both the law of large numbers and central limit theorem exist also note that we did not make any assumption about the error terms being having to be normally distributed that's very important to understand here is a multiple choice question to test your understanding you have two time series, which I shall sketch here. So this is the first one, we call that MT. And here comes the second, we call it PT. Uh, two time series, it's not important how long they are, what exactly they are. From these plots, can you infer that A, both MT and PT are covariant stationary? B, neither mt nor pt are covariant stationary c only mt is covariant stationary or d only pt is covariant stationary so pause the clip and think Here's the solution. One way we can think about covariant stationarity is to split the sample somewhere, say in the middle, then look at the two sub-periods we created, and think about all the characteristics of the time series, like the expected value and the variance. If they're equal in both sub-periods, that means we are possibly having a covariant stationary series. For PT, that is clearly not the case, whereas MT, they could well be equal, but for PT, clearly the expected value is smaller in the first sub-period and the variance is smaller in the first sub-period. So that's not covariant stationary. So B, A is incorrect, C is correct, D is incorrect. So here comes the second question. We're using the same time series as the ones we used in question one. And now consider estimating the following model, mt as dependent variable, pt as explanatory variable, a linear model. Now you should expect beta hat all s to be which of the following? A, blue, B, normally distributed for large samples, C, a consistent estimator, or D, an estimator without any nice properties. Pause and think. So here's the solution. Previously we decided that PT was not covariant stationary altogether. Actually neither MT nor PT are IID. Okay. IIDness, however, is an element of the Gauss-Markov assumptions which we need to establish the blue property for an estimator. So since Gauss-Markov is not met, this parameter estimator or less estimator is not going to be blue. For B and C, these are large sample properties 
properties for time series data. For consistency, we need a time series assumptions one to three. For normally being normally distributed, time series assumptions are one to five. Since PT is not covariant stationary, assumption one is not met. Therefore, B and C are incorrect. D, however, is the only correct solution.